starting to think about your fall stewardship program. How are we going to fund our ministries for 2012? This is why I'm so happy to have with us today a man who has been called the most knowledgeable person in America when it comes to local church stewardship. His name is Dr. Cliff Christopher. Uh, he's written a couple of books. One of them I received not long ago, Not Your Parents' Offering Plate. There's a sequel to this out there now already. Uh, but this book raises a number of important questions, I think, that are important for us to examine as we look at growing our congregations. I did this interview with Dr. Christopher, uh, found out that the video was wrong on my end. So uh, when you see the, I was going to pull the video, but I thought, he gives such great information that if you want to listen to the mp3 you're probably better off um, or just not look at my side of the screen when the video plays uh, because i'm frozen and he's rather animated but nonetheless i wanted him to talk to us as the president and ceo of horizons stewardship about what he does about what he observes in congregations and what we need to do to uh, address stewardship uh, in congregations that, that are looking to grow. So with no further ado, here's Dr. Christopher. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity. I know that finding uh, both a day and a time was not the easiest thing for, for either one of us to do. And thank you for uh, staying on that. And we have finally made this connection. Uh, Horizon Stewardship was founded in 1992 uh, after uh, I'd spent nearly 20 years in pastoral ministry. Uh, founded this company uh, out of seeing a large number of uh, my colleagues in the churches they were serving uh, making significant mistakes that in some cases just destroyed ministry uh, in and around decisions that they were making in financial stewardship. Uh, Horizons was founded to assist churches in all areas of financial stewardship uh, be it uh, annual giving, capital giving, plan giving. Uh, we've expanded that out to help churches with vision and strategic planning uh, and, uh, and other areas that are so necessary for, for growth to take place. Uh, since uh, the founding, uh, Horizons now has uh, not just myself, but 16 consultants that work uh, around the uh, United States with churches of, of all denominations. We also work with nonprofits uh, as well. And uh, it's been a, a wonderful blessing and, uh, and a great ministry to be a part of. And so you go into a lot of churches, you go into a lot of churches all the time. And let me ask you, what do, uh, what do churches in general, how do we do with stewardship? Uh, terrible. <laughs> uh, and that's borne out with statistics that we uh, see that come out every year that uh, the share of giving that religion now receives is, is at the lowest ebb that it's ever been. Uh, we don't have the market share of the charitable gifts that we used to. Uh, religion used to receive close to 60% of all charitable dollars in America. Uh, today it's around 33%, about a third. Wow. That's a significant market share drop off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've, to me, the biggest uh, thing that I see that has caused that is that we are continue, uh, continuing to communicate with donors, our members, the same way we did in the 40s, in the 50s, in the 60s. We really have not changed, though society itself has changed significantly. Uh, and we see ourselves uh, losing that market share as persons don't quit giving. Charitable giving as a whole has remained rather constant, but, uh, but they have begun to choose another path for those gifts. And, and, uh, and I can imagine that the, the reason for that is multifaceted, but you're identifying the main reason is that churches aren't asking like they should. Is that true? What other factors are, are contributing? Well, we to certainly aren't asking like we should. I, I think the if we tried to sum it up in as succinctly as I could, I would say that they don't know how to compete. Uh, they were pastors and church leaders were never really told that you're in a competitive environment for that charitable dollar. Uh, our message has just been: you should give. You should give. You ought to give. Well, the, the new message is, here is why you should give to us. And we're very unprepared to make that case. And because of it, our people have continued to give. They have just shifted many of those funds 
uh, to nonprofits and other charitable areas. Mm -hmm. Now, there, the, the theological uh, questions that this bring up that this brings up has to do with: um, Is the church a business? Uh, isn't the church a business? Um, how much do we rely on God, or do we rely on, say, marketing techniques or stewardship techniques? I'm sure you you probably are asked that question frequently. Sure. Well, it's it is a business. Uh, of being about God's business. <laughs> um, God is always the one that we answer to and we do our work on behalf of. And, and that's one of our bigger problems. We tend as a church to ask more economic questions than we ask spiritual questions in regards to what we ought to be about. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a both and. Uh, it, it is a business, but it's very much a spiritual business. In fact, that's the only business we ought to be in. Um, we've lost that focus uh, in the last few decades, and churches now see themselves in the recreation business, in the fellowship business, in the food business. Um, and, and frankly, our, we're in the Jesus business. And uh, if we lose sight of that, uh, we'll quickly lose out to people who do recreation and food and fellowship better than we do. Mm -hmm. But nobody, nobody brings Jesus uh, but the church. And, and that's where we've, we've lost our focus uh, and lost our message. And, and so uh, the, the, the energy, vitality, the, um, the passion that we, we see perhaps written in the book of Acts, etc., or we read about uh, from the early church is something that should be recaptured in a way to, to uh, motivate folk to give to, uh, give to the, the, the work of Christ through our churches. Well, no, no question. And, you know, if you'll find those churches that are doing their preaching and 3,000 are coming to join the church, as you mm -hmm. uh, saw in, in the book of Acts, are those churches that just happen to have a per capita giving level much higher than others. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it is because donors want in their gifts to the church to be making an investment that produces a return. And when they see that return with uh, persons being uh, baptized and confirmed into the church when they see attendance going up when they see lives being changed then they want to make that investment they want to make that contribution and uh, you know the the church coffers grow frankly didn't have anything to do with how they were passing the offering plate it had everything to do with how they were changing lives and people who wanted to invest in them Draw a distinction, if you will, for me between a donor who we typically think is going to give to a nonprofit uh, versus a parishioner who we uh, we don't always use the same term for. We don't, and I think when it comes to to Christian financial stewardship, uh, we need to see that parishioner as a donor. Okay, and I don't think we need to make that distinction, and we have uh, nonprofits. Uh, understand that what they need to communicate to persons who they want support from is how they're doing their mission, how they are changing lives. You know, how, how many boys are being affected by the Boy Scouts? How, how many graduates are finding jobs by the college? You know, that's what people want to give towards. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the church needs to understand its mission and communicate to persons about exactly how that mission is being done. That's the way you talk to donors. Mm -hmm. We have tended to talk to them as members. Members we can associate with country club or other organization. Those persons have, quote, an obligation mm -hmm. to support. Um, our members don't feel that same obligation uh, to, uh, to give to the church, certainly not sacrificially if they don't see a return coming from it. Okay. Uh, and I encourage be... pastors to, 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 to use the word donor far more than they use mm -hmm. member uh, as a mindset that they, a pastor, need to get into about how that person's thinking. Okay. And you, you bring up this idea over and over again in your book about transforming lives. And certainly uh, the, uh, the, the reason for the church is, is for worship. And so our lives are transformed through worship and the lives of those whom we re reach out to. So it's, it's making the case then, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, for how 
uh, that shaping and forming and building a community is an important part of God's work in the world. No question. Um, you know, what we have done is by and large kept those stories of how we have transformed lives a secret. <laughs> yeah. uh, no other nonprofit does that. I mean, they're actively sharing their story in a very personal way that people can understand. Uh, I frequently reference folks to uh, hospital ads they may see regarding children's hospitals and other things that are, are run to get people to give to them. What those ads will most often focus on is one child. Mm -hmm. And you'll see and understand the story. They won't say, oh, we had you know, 10,462 children, which was an 8% increase in the numbers of children from there. They'll tell you about Johnny. Yeah. And people come to see how sick Johnny became well Johnny. Mm -hmm. That's what churches need to do. And, and utilizing worship and other settings, which bring our people together, we need to get those stories in front of persons. Yeah, and that's, and a, that's an age old, um, eight, eight, I mean, testimony is one of the oldest Christian traditions there is when it comes to sharing our story. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, what we know is in surveys run, the number one reason why people choose to give to any organization is a belief in the mission. Mm -hmm. And persons uh, are by and large kept in the dark as to how the church is really doing its mission uh, in a personal kind of way. They hear things like, oh, we sent uh, $50,000 to Somalia. Eh, you know, mm -hmm. tell me the story of how a child over there was affected by what we did, those sorts of things. That's that's what we need to learn to do. And uh, we tend to fall back on saying, well, we don't want to get that personal. People know they just ought to give, and that's just not true anymore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, you, you're, you've got a lot of things going off in my head. We can take this a lot of different ways. But one thing I want you to do is to take me inside of, I won't say my congregation, um, but I will say a typical congregation, uh, which, which, as you know, you know, 80% of America's churches are plateaued, uh, not growing, um, or declining. Yeah. And stewardship declining. is often a main part of that. Um, walk me inside a typical church and tell me not just what you identify, because you've identified some things already, but how do we begin to change? Well, I think it begins with an understanding of persons of what that mission is and a coming together around that mission. Um, you know, I spent 18 years in the Army, and the warrior ethos of the Army begins with number one, you always put mission first. That's, what, that's the first thing that you do. Well, that's the first thing that a church ought to do. But what I find when I go in, and it's one of the first things we look for as we talk to and interview congregants of that church, I say to them, what's the mission of your church? And 99 times out of 100, the answer I'll get back is, well, I really don't know, but I think it ought to be this or it ought to be that. But there's no unifying factor or understanding as to what it is we are about. Um, and that's where it begins. You, you've got to have those persons all on the same page of knowing why we do what we do, that then when you report back to them, they have some measurement uh, as they're trying to understand, did we accomplish, you know, the mission that we're to be about? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing that, that we look at. Uh, the second thing that I would tell you that, that I explore most in depth uh, is uh, the senior pastor of that church's role in relationship to Christian financial stewardship. Uh, how does he or she give? Uh, what's uh, their theology? about stewardship, how do they feel about it, how they communicate about it, how do they write about it, uh, how do they themselves make decisions about their own giving, what are they teaching their people. Um, if we don't have uh, a leader who is solidly committed to Christian financial stewardship personally and professionally, 
you know, might as well just turn around and go home because whatever you recommend and, and seek to try to do in that church will fail. Mm-hmm. It will not. Fail. Well, chances are you probably didn't get to that church without the senior pastor inviting you in, so that he's probably already read about what you do and is already in favor of it. But there are probably some adapt adaptations to the the senior minister's uh, behavior that you might uh, point out, huh? Yeah, there really is. And, and in fact, you'd be surprised at the numbers of them who call because one, there is a problem mm-hmm. and they're frankly hoping that we can fix the problem mm-hmm. without having to deal with them personally. Okay. Uh, and, and, and that's a very uncomfortable place to be and, and a very difficult place to be. Well, go into that a little bit because I, I'm a pastor of a congregation myself and many of our listeners are pastors. Maybe we're not seeing some of the important things that we should be looking at in terms of self-reflection. Well, certainly we've got to look at our own giving. And, and, you know, I'm not a legalist in regards to tithing. But if a pastor is not giving at least 10% of their income back to the Lord's work, I really want to know why have they chosen to invest so little? What's going on that they have made a decision not to do that? Uh, I want to hear from them. What What is the theology you're operating from that says that you should give lower than that benchmark? Uh, so that's that's certainly one of the measuring sticks that, that I use. Um, you know, I find a number of reasons for that. The, the most oft given reason is that uh, my own personal finances are so messed up and have been for years that I, I can't and I don't know how to get there. Uh, they've just made terrible financial decisions in regards to debt, etc. I had a pastor uh, in my office uh, not too long ago, I had $60,000 worth of credit card debt. That pastor is not going to preach on Christian financial stewardship. That pastor is not going to give like they should. Uh, they're just going to stay away from it because they're, the sin is so great in, in their own life. And so the congregation is going to suffer as a result. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that person has more ability to control the outcome of something that, than easily any other single individual in that congregation. So it, it gets a great deal of, of my focus. Uh, now, the, the other thing that I look at uh, it, with pastors is not... Uh, you know, where they are personally, which is the first thing they have to get together. But if they are where they need to be, then how aware are they of the other individuals within their church being where they should be with their giving? Do they know uh, the donor records of their congregation? There is frankly no excuse for a pastor not to know where his or her support is coming from in the life of an organization they're responsible for. Uh, and it is easily the single biggest factor, I believe, that can give you a glimpse into what's happening with one soul. Mm-hmm. So why have they chosen not to know? And you get some uh, pushback from that. And I can suspect that uh, some churches are rather proud to be able to say our pastor is concentrating 100% on ministry and we as the church board are taking care of money. I can understand that um, some pastors may say, look, the sacraments aren't for sale. And I don't want to find myself spending more time with X, Y, and Z or more giving them more attention uh, than I do other needy people in the congregation who perhaps don't have as deep a wallet. Mm-hmm. Well, and, well, and I'll, uh, there's two things you just mentioned there, Chris, and, and, and I'll, I'll address the first one first, which is, you know, are there congregations who sort of brag that we want our pastor involved in ministry, uh, we'll take care of the money. Um, I don't buy that. I, I, you know, I don't think you can separate money from ministry. It has everything to do with ministry. That's, that's why they call. You know, our ministry is in serious decline, mm-hmm. quote, because of money. Mm-hmm. Um, the two very well go together. Or that, uh, that money uh, is not some sort of indicator of one's spiritual health. It, it's a huge indicator. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I don't believe that someone can truly love Jesus and not give. I mean, I, I don't know how they can. I don't believe you can truly love Jesus and not want to worship. So, you know, it's my job as a pastor not to raise money and it's not to build attendance in a sanctuary. My job is to bring persons into a closer 
uh, relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Uh, now, I can do that job better when I know more about those persons. Mm -hmm. uh, so I need to know how often are they worshiping? Mm -hmm. How often are they in prayer and in Bible study? How are they in service and how are they giving? Because these are spiritual disciplines that can give me some insight as a human pastor. I'm not God, so I can't totally read the heart. But, but you're you know, working on that. <laughs> I'm not going to get there. But <laughs> as, a, as a, a Methodist, we believe we're going on to perfection. There you according go. To, but, uh, but my job is to help them grow. And I need to use every diagnostic tool I can to help persons do that. Being blind to what one is doing in any of those areas, missions, worship, giving, uh, is frankly uh, refusing to use a diagnostic tool to help that person grow spiritually. Mm -hmm. So I would say to that, that board, uh, frankly, I don't buy the argument. I don't think that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very sarcastically, I believe what they're saying is, look, the biggest sin in our own life is giving and our love of material things. We really don't want our preacher to get that close to our sin, so I just as soon they not know. That's what I think is going on, and we have handed the keys to the church to those types of sinners for too long, and that that needs to stop. Um, the uh, and, and perhaps I addressed it when you were talking. The sacraments are not for sale, mm -hmm. um, and should we be spending more time with those who have significant financial means than those who don't? And my answer to that's no. Uh, we, we, we should not. And, and I hope that wasn't what was interpreted from the book. Mm -hmm. The majority of pastors that I work with uh, are far more afraid of persons with wealth than they are persons who are poor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and they stay away from them. And, and let me stop you there because I, I noticed that as and, and I, I noticed that in my ministry and knowing other ministers. Is that a trend or has that always been around? Um, certainly, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's always been with us. Okay. Uh, and because the wealthy in, in any society or those of significant means uh, are a small percentage. Uh, so, uh, you know, when, when a pastor... Uh, is seen or spends intentional time with with persons like that. The the perception is that uh, you're ignoring ninety percent of the rest of us, and it kind of gives us a good argument to uh, justify other uh, behaviors that, that may not be appropriate in our own life. Uh, but pastors were were sort of taught for years to quote, "Don't pastor your money," uh, and and the reason they were told not to do it is it'll keep you out of trouble. People won't, won't gripe and they won't grumble and, mm -hmm. and whatever. So be sure that you don't pastor your money, um, meaning spend most of your time with, with the, the wealthy folks, which if you're spending time where you need to spend it, uh, they're not going to get the majority of your time, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they are going to get some. Uh, it, it's obvious from reading scripture, Jesus was far more worried about the rich man going to heaven than he was the poor man. Uh, those persons need our time. Uh, they need help discovering what to do with this that has been placed into my life. You know, how, how do I handle that? That's a pastor's job. Um, you know, uh, pastor, I've got a lot of money. I want to be sure I don't fall in love with it. I don't want to be the rich young ruler. You know, so pastor, help me. Most of our pastors, uh, frankly, if the rich young ruler came to us, you know, would say, hey, you know, you've been following those Ten Commandments and you've been a good boy and mm -hmm. society thinks you're great. Well done. Uh, keep it up. Thanks so much. And, and by the way, I want to put you on the board next year. Yeah, we'd be uh, intimidated by their wealth and their power and wouldn't be able to minister them in, a, in an effective way. We, we'd be afraid to tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and uh, I'm just saying that our job, as we can help persons to... Uh, to remove sin from their life mm -hmm. and replace it with Jesus, then that's what we're supposed to be doing. And, and we should never, ever apologize for trying to separate somebody from that which they love more than God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, so, and, and that's, that's where I come from. So the idea is, is, is not to uh, pastor the rich 
if you will. But the idea is to pay special attention to your biggest donors. It's to pay special attention to to all of your persons okay. to help them use gifts they have been given for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I, I think I use the analogy in the book that if you had someone come into your congregation who happened to have just retired from singing with the Metropolitan Opera in New York City, uh, would your members be upset if you refused to make a call over there to suggest that she used that voice in worship for the good of the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Probably they would. It's a very obvious gift. And as the pastor of the church, you need to go and say to them, you know, the kingdom could use your gift. Mm -hmm. And this is how, and I invite you to do that. The Lord's blessed you. Uh, money is, is another gift. Okay. And, and, and our job is to help them use it. Um, but not, uh, you know, we take physicians. Uh, uh, rich or poor ones. Our job is how do we take that physician and say, you know, there's persons without health care and we would invite you to use your gift in this way. We take teachers and say, hey, we have a need. The kingdom has a need for your gift. It's not favoring them. I, I think what I'm suggesting is we quit disfavoring them mm -hmm. and, and we treat them like anyone in our congregation who's been significantly blessed. Okay. Okay. Okay, so um, take me then, if you will, to something that, that you spend a lot of time in the book in, and, and that's okay. about asking. Uh, yes. That, that, that's about um, us being able to say what we mean, what we want, and to put that in a mm -hmm. way that's not going to be offensive, but is going to be invitational, if you will. Would you talk a little sure. bit about that? And, and what I'd say quickly is it's not what we want, but it's what the church, the kingdom needs that, that we would be asking for. Um, to me, an ask on someone to make a gift uh, is, is, is like an evangelism call. Uh, it's, it's sharing that which we're passionate about, that which we believe in uh, with someone else and the belief that if they will join us in this endeavor, their life too will be richly blessed. And, and that's the way any ask you know, should be done. Um, and more and more, I think the ask by a pastor to a parishioner is becoming more important, number one, because nonprofits in our society have become very sophisticated. Uh, they have learned how to relate to donors. Those same people sitting in our pews are being asked, personally being asked by the Red Cross and the hospital and the college, et cetera. And they have become very accustomed to someone sitting down and sharing of what it is that's needed and how they might help and inviting them to be a part with the exception of the church. Uh, so, you know, I happen to believe that the cause of the church is more important than any of those others that I mentioned who are vital and, and wonderful uh, uh, ministries, but the church is first. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get in line mm -hmm. and we need to say to those persons, you know, we could really use your help here and a gift like this would make this kind of difference and this kind of an impact. And, and I would invite you to consider that uh, is not in any way, you know, inappropriate. Uh, I think it's inappropriate if we sit down and we say, now, now, Chris, what you ought to do is this, or what you have to do, et cetera. Uh, you know, that's, you know, that, that, that kind of language and that kind of attitude is, is inappropriate and will be rejected. But, you know, Chris, I want to share with you uh, an opportunity that I'm very excited about. I think can make a tremendous difference in the church and in the lives of, of countless numbers of people. And, and you may have the rare ability to help make this happen. Uh, and let me share that with you. And, and I do. And then I would say, uh, you know, I would hope, Chris, you might consider, you know, a gift of such and such that would allow that to, to take place. That's the kind of conversation they're having with the president of the college, with the executive director of Boy Scouts and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people of significant means. And we're just not in that line. And, and I want us to get there because I think that's preventing us from getting the gift. Now, do you have a, uh, a stewardship campaign model, if you will, or do you have a, uh, a framework that you typically recommend to churches? That We, we have 
several varied models in regards to capital campaigns mm -hmm. that that we bring in depending upon the size and the need and the nature of, of that church, be it debt or be it new building or relocation or whether it's got a thousand in worship or 150 in worship. Mm -hmm. So we do have different models that we work with there. What about in terms the, of, of, of um, I mean, that's the annual capital budget, campaigns, but annual giving? Yeah, in the annual giving, uh, number one, what we'd say is if you are still having to purchase your campaign out of a box mm -hmm. and to use a certain box, that is a sign that you have failed. Mm -hmm. uh, you have failed to grow stewards as it should be. Now, frankly, that's a reality in the majority of our churches. So, you know, shame on you, but shame on most of them. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let me uh, back up before you, you elaborate on that. How does one grow stewards? How does one identify them? Uh, well, you know, one I'd say I, I think uh, reading that book you referenced might be a good a good uh, a good start because the the book really tries to make the case of how we need to make a cultural shift in stewardship. Um, and sometimes persons will say, well, well, you know, can you give me an example of sort of who's done that, who who's doing it? Yeah. Uh, just walk into any Pentecostal church you see, find mm -hmm. an assembly of God. Uh, they don't have annual campaigns. It's a part of their DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, go visit with the Mormons. Uh, it's a part of their DNA. Now, in many of our mainline denominations, it was a part of their DNA when they were established. Very high expectations, understanding of what they should be. Mm -hmm. Over uh, decades upon decades, those churches, frankly, lowered standards, lowered what membership really means. Mm -hmm. Persons now come in and they want to be a member, but they don't understand they're called to be a disciple. So it's frankly redoing that culture to where persons come to understand being a part, marrying into the body of Christ is being a disciple that carries with it high expectations. That's where I want us to go. Not this is the best box out there. Go buy it, you know, and run it. Right. So you would Until have we, any any person who just joins the church, etc., or has, has just begun attending. You would have some sort of a pamphlet or some sort of sheet or some sort of statement that says, "Here's what we understand financially in terms of what being a member is about." I, I would. I I strongly believe in membership classes being required of all persons prior to joining the church. Uh, extensive classes mm -hmm. that when those classes are done those persons are signing covenants mm -hmm. as to how they'll live out their faith not you know we're not saying you've you've attained uh, you know the, the highest level of right. spirituality mm -hmm. but I'm I'm joining this church and I'm going to covenant to do this in service and mission outside the walls of my church mm -hmm. I'm going to covenant to do this uh, in my own educational growth and development in but isn't, isn't that going against the grain of where really society is? I mean, we're not a nation of joiners as we used to be. We have a lot of people who turn up even when nonprofits have events, and they, they don't necessarily want to want to even give you much detail about who they are, but they want to come, yeah. they want to be a part of it. But there, there's really this kind of pushback against membership. Do you see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do see it. Uh I'm not there. I'm, I'm not an advocate of that. I, you know, I see more persons living together today versus getting married. Right, I see, right. You know, I, I don't believe that's the way we need to go as a society. I think that society is best served and persons are best served when there are genuine commitments made mm -hmm. between that man and woman that, that, that we call, uh, you know, marriage right. versus let's mm -hmm. just live together. Uh, uh, though, you know, uh, I'm not going to say to somebody, look, you've been you've been coming here for the last eight weeks. So, you know, either put up or shut up. You know, we don't I would never want to go there. Right. But I would want to say to them, look, you can attend forever. Yeah. Forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and call us if you need help. Uh, join us for any of our, our studies. Uh, be in worship with us. You know, anything you'd like to do at the point you want to join. However, we want you to fully understand what being a disciple of Christ and making a commitment to Christ is all about. Mm -hmm. And therefore we have these classes of which Christian financial stewardship is but one part. Mm -hmm. You know, worship is certainly a key part of that. Missions is a key part of that. 
uh, their own nurture and development. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's exciting to me. Uh, when I see a church that says, uh, oh, we had 900 in worship, how many members do you have? 550. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've got 550 committed disciples, and they got 400 others who are coming regularly, you know, studying on that. Sure. Uh, sure, sure. That's a church that you're going to find giving far above average, and you're also going to find that church giving itself away in society and the world in some great ways too. What's your definition of stewardship? Uh, I mean, you know, simply put, stewardship is understanding that we are but the trustees of that which belongs to someone else, and it's it's how we choose uh, uh, to use it uh, as the owner would have it be used. Uh, which is why I, I, I frequently will say Christian financial stewardship versus just stewardship because we're to be stewards mm-hmm. of other than money. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, all has been a gift of God. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, much like uh, that opera singer should be a steward of that voice. Mm-hmm. And her question should be, how does God want me to use it? The wealthy man is, should be a steward of his wallet. How does God want me to use it? Why do you suppose that's so hard for us to get? Well, number one, we're constantly bombarded with a message that it's not in giving away, but in acquiring that we'll really find happiness and joy. Everything tells us to do that. Uh, And sadly, many of our churches succumb to that just so that our people won't be upset with us. Uh, and, And we don't we don't push them to where Christ wanted them to go either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Money has always been uh, the last thing that guarded someone's heart. Uh, You can get through just about everything else. And I think Billy Graham said, you know, the wallet is the last thing that sits between somebody's heart and God. And I believe that's true. Uh, uh, But it's difficult. Uh, You know, you look out here, uh, you know, what are we concerned about today? Today, we're all concerned our 401ks are down, uh, market's way down, what's going to happen with the debt ceiling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're having all kinds of conversations about this as if our real salvation is in the 401k. Church is a nice thing, but the 401k is what's really going to do it. Uh, you know, I, uh, church is a good thing, but I really need to have a certain size of house and I need et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's not faith and, and that's, not, uh, that's not Jesus as Lord. Money is really Lord. Well, we're, uh, we're really living in a society that not only commands but, um, but really rewards selfishness. And, 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 and that, that's a very difficult place to lift up things like hope, things like giving yourself away. Um, carrying your cross, uh, sure. It, it, that becomes it, it, you know, uh, which you know is still the question, Chris, that, that I get and those that work for me get uh, almost every day from pastors, church leaders. They'll call us and say, "Do you think we should do such and such in our church with the economy like it is?" And the first question that we'll ask back is, "Well, what?" what do you believe the Lord is calling you to do? And it's very obvious that that's a question they've never asked. They'll stammer around and, and then they'll say, well, yeah, I understand all the need for that, but you know, when the market is down 700 points, uh, do you think people will really get, that's just not the first question, but that's where we're going. We're looking at our decisions, even with the development of the body of Christ and what we're asking is financial questions. And that's interesting that I can imagine you get a lot of those questions from pastors. Oh, absolutely. You know, from people who really should should understand the basics of stewardship, that you're not here yeah. forever, that it, you know, you, you, you're watching over it for the next generation, etc. Oh, uh, the majority of those questions come from pastors. Mm-hmm. Now, they sort of seem a little embarrassed when you come back and yeah. say, you know, it's a spiritual issue. Let's talk spirit. Uh, yeah, and they stum around. But, you know, my finance committee wanted me to call and see what you thought about, you know, the economy. Right. It's it's kind of sad. And, you know, that's another reason. It's that attitude that, frankly, has caused a number of our donors to decide to look elsewhere. Uh 
that church to me has a mission to build a building or balance a budget. That church doesn't understand its mission is to bring people into relationship with Christ. Um, or they'd be asking spiritual questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that uh, that may, may make for some embarrassing pauses when the person who's the, the, the stewardship, the, the paid consultant, uh, actually brings up the more spiritual questions to the person who's supposed to be the more spiritual leader. Um, well, and, and I think that, you know, that's what I hear in the marketplace as we work with churches that will say to us, uh, you know, Horizon sure was different from anybody we worked with before. You, you guys really cared more about, you know, growing our church than you did raising the money. Uh, and that's always our focus. You know, we're not in the money business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's, you know, money is nothing. It, it's absolutely nothing if it doesn't produce fruit. And it's that fruit that, that we're after. And, uh, and that's what we're pushing our churches for. Yeah, we know a lot about money, uh, and we'd like to help you with that aspect that hopefully you can produce fruit. Mm -hmm. But we haven't won when we just filled up the coffers. Mm -hmm. We've only won when people's lives are changed. Yeah, and, and getting back to, um, to something that's mentioned in your book that's along those lines is this importance of uh, Christian financial education. Uh, that, yes. that, that how can we expect our, our, congreg our congregants to give more if their own lives are in shambles and that perhaps the church should be a place to have those conversations? No question. No question. Uh, and frankly, we've got some marvelous tools out there right now. I mean, things like financial peace, crown ministries, good sense. I mean, there's a, a, a you know several of them there, mm -hmm. all of whom I'm perfectly happy for a church to choose to work with because they do provide that kind of excellent education can then be augmented by, by pastors in, in, in other and additional ways, but uh, they do a great job of helping persons get their act together. You know, the man I referenced earlier that has $60,000 in credit card debt, I can beat on him every day if I want to and tell him he ought to tithe, but frankly, he's, he's drowning right now. It's not a real good time to teach him how to swim. <laughs> right. You know, I, I, need to, I need to grab a hold of him and at least convince him I can keep your head above water doing this. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll work on learning how to swim once we've secured your life a little bit. And, and that's what those classes do. And we owe it to our members to offer those. You, and you sure? Yeah, I, I'm, in a, uh, I'm in a smaller church, uh, which is the majority of churches in America. That, and we have a hard time uh, having people turn out consistently for Christian education. When you bring up something like uh, financial peace or financial... Um, uh, classes having to do with with balancing budgets, that kind of thing. Um, there's the embarrassment factor. Uh, is one, <laughs> two is does the does the pastor have a an ulterior motive, uh, and yeah. and wants us to do this so that the church can can raise more money? How do you uh, how do you answer those those roadblocks? Well, number one, pastors are perceived as having that ulterior motive because mm -hmm. in the past all their discussion around money was because they had an ulterior motive. I mean, it was true. They talked about it one or two times a year at the most, always in September, October, when we're getting ready to do the drive. And then they almost made a point. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. And I shut it down. And if y'all will just bring money in, you know, we're good. Uh, they just have not been seen uh, as spiritual leaders in regards to money in people's lives. Pastors who are seen that way don't get that perception of, of having an ulterior motive. Uh, the issue of persons coming, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I used to reference it's kind of like the marriage class, you know, mm -hmm. that you'd say, you know, uh, after church, you want to sign up for the get your marriage fixed mm -hmm. class, you know, use the sheet in the back. Well, you know, there's a dozen people in your congregation have marriage trouble, but they ain't signing that sheet. No, they're going to be the last ones to sign it. That's right. They're, they're, they're embarrassed. Same thing used to be with money. Mm -hmm. It has changed in the last two or three years because of the recession. Everybody has lost. Everybody has suffered in varied degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that, the perception is not, oh, I did something bad uh, because I'm in debt trouble. Uh, the perception now is society is really messed up and I need to learn how to cope with it mm -hmm. along with everyone else. So when the church offers this kind of class, it, it's much more easily received you never used to have somebody show up at church and see a friend and 
you know, and say to them, hey, you know, you've been losing money in the market, you know, they didn't talk about it. Now they do. Yeah. And they say, yeah, me too. Boy, we, we all took a hit. So to some extent, we have gotten much more comfortable, Chris, and we can do it. Uh, but uh, in the uh, in the past, it was more difficult. Right. right, yeah. right. It's even become a pretty good evangelism tool. We can take it out, uh, uh, advertise it around, and persons who haven't been in church will say, hey, I do have that problem. Mm -hmm. I'm, I think I'll go over there on Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Comes a, a good way to reach out. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, well, I wanted to just ask, uh, if I could, as we, uh, as we draw to a close, um, if you could suggest three things for a congregation to do, um, to grow, and, and, and you know, this is more of a spiritual conversation than it is a management yeah. conversation uh, because of the yeah. very nature of giving, the nature of your ministry, the nature of money in the Bible. So how might you address a question like that? Well, the first the first thing I would share with them is easy, and that's you've got to raise expectations from the very beginning. You've got to move to a high expectation culture from a low expectation culture, and that will begin with what you do with new members, uh, and let let that seep into your old. You, you just can't get up on Sunday and say, "Okay, starting tomorrow, the rules have changed." Mm -hmm. uh, but you can work that with new members and slowly but surely shift to a high expectation culture. That's easily number one. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the second uh, thing that I think that the, the church, I mean, to make the biggest difference, uh, the pastor is going to have to be fully committed, personally and professionally, to, to getting that done. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the point that their, their house is in order, and then they're going to have to learn to preach and teach uh, about this uh, without apologizing uh, really come into grips with this is a sin in the lives of my people and if they don't like it it's probably because they need it yeah uh, and, uh, and and to stay firm in that uh, the the third uh, I think would be being aware of who your giving leaders are so that you can place giving leaders into giving positions in the life of the church to lead other people. For instance, the finance committee is too often filled with persons in financial occupations, but they are not necessarily good stewards. They don't know Jesus, they just know money. And, and a pastor should know all that he can about those persons who so often are the gatekeepers of ministry uh, to ensure that they understand that we are in the Jesus business uh, and you're helping us with money that we can be in the Jesus business. Otherwise, those leaders will block anything the pastor tries to do uh, to grow stewards because they personally don't want to grow. And secondly, they don't understand the mission. Uh, their mission is to balance that budget. Uh, and that's really sad. I, I saw a church the other day that was really, really struggling, and, and I went to worship there, and the finance chairman got up, and he announced, he said, this is a great day. We have just finished uh, making decisions in our board, uh, and we have uh, cut back on about a half dozen different ministries uh, to uh, save money and we have chosen not to replace one staff position and this now uh, allows us to see that we have a chance to balance the budget for the first time this year and everybody applied. As if the mission of the church was to have a balanced budget. That's right. That's exactly, And that frankly was his mission. That was his mission. And, and it was just sad. It was sad. And and under his leadership, so said the congregation applauded that we couldn't hire a staff person that was needed, and we cut six ministries. Yeah. So uh, that's why I say I think one of the most important things we can do is make sure that we have stewards in those positions. Boy, that is that is that is a terrific. 
point because the stewards are the ones, as you as you alluded to, are the ones who get the mission, and and yeah. will will then be able to, to to wave the flags for the mission and be able to, um, as as you say, it said number one, to uh, help bolster that. Uh, that aura, that atmosphere of expectation. So Dr. Um, J. Cliff Christopher, I want to thank you very much for making time for us today. Um, wonderful uh, words of wisdom for us. I will have all kinds of things on the website in terms of books that you recommend and uh, that kind of thing. So thanks so much for joining us on this edition of Grow My Church. Thank you, Chris. Happy to do it.